everyone. My name is Jennifer Gibson. I'm Director Curator of Gallery 1 CO3, which is the Campus Art Gallery of the University of Winnipeg. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's talk with Christina Battle. This event is presented in conjunction with Christina's solo exhibition, Forecast, which is on, on view in Gallery 1 CO3 from February 29th until April 12th. The exhibition is an ongoing series that considers the entanglement between environmental, social, political, and economic challenges facing the current moment. With a focus on air quality and weather prediction, video, banner, and sculptural works in this exhibition consider the complex ways in which we both sense and anticipate the climate crisis. So before we continue, I would like to acknowledge that Gallery 1 CO3 is on Treaty 1 territory, the heartland of the Red River Métis, and the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Inanu, Anishinaabe, Dakota Oyete, and Dene Sulene. Our water is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the devastation and grief that we are witnessing close to home and around the world at this time. And I want to express solidarity with those who have experienced and are experiencing the violence of colonization, which among many other travesties includes massive damage to um, our global environment and the air that we all breathe. I want to express my deep appreciation to Christina Battle for bringing her important, impactful work to Gallery 1 CO3, which offers our community the opportunity to think deeply and discuss the interconnectedness of environmental destruction with sociopolitical and economic factors. And I want to thank Mariana Munoz Gomez for writing a thought provoking and contextualized response to the exhibition, which explores Christina's focus on how the climate crisis affects our bodily senses and points to cases of environmental racism. One of the examples that Mariana refers to is Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. We should all be aware that white set, well, sorry, that while settlers built an aqueduct more than 100 years ago to supply Winnipeg with clean drinking water, this action displaced and isolated the Indigenous peoples of Shoal Lake and left them with a contaminated water supply. They were under one of the longest boil water advisories in this country. Even now, they are unduly burdened with the maintenance of a water treatment plant, and they have had to fight the government for decades for a road, Freedom Road, to be built to connect them to the mainland. So I do invite you to read Mariana's essay, which can be found on our website. Our website is uh, www.uwinnipeg.ca forward slash art dash gallery. And I will actually put the specific URL in the chat in a few moments. Um, also at this time, um, and Christina may refer to this during her talk, uh, I want to thank um, Christina and uh, the University of Winnipeg Library for um, preparing a library guide of extended readings that Christina has recommended. And again, the uh, URL for that will appear in the chat later on. And I think Christina may also share in the chat um, links to her slides. So, for today's event format, moderator Dr. Riva Simcoe will introduce the artist and then Christina will speak for about 40 minutes. We will then be open to questions from the audience. I encourage you to submit your questions to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. A couple of housekeeping items. We have ASL interpretation and captioning. This event will be recorded and made available on Gallery 1 CO3's YouTube playlist in about one week's time. And I want to thank uh, Lacey Kaler for interpreting today. I would now like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Riva Simcoe. Dr. Riva Simcoe, she, her, is a white settler from Treaty 6 territory in Alberta. Currently, Riva is head of collections and exhibitions and curator of Canadian art at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, Kamajuk. She has lived and worked across the continent from Newfoundland to Alaska, uh, holding posts with institutions such as Kimura Gallery, University of Alberta Museums, ex-curated curatorial collective, Nuit Blanche Edmonton, and Modern Fuel Artist Run Centre. 
Riva's current areas of critical and curatorial concern include gender equity, climate change, and anti-racist pedagogy and methodology. Riva is currently teaching the University of Winnipeg history course, Art, Nature, Climate, and we are pleased that her class is joining us today. So I am going to now turn it over to Riva to uh, introduce Christina. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jennifer. And it's our pleasure as a class to welcome Christina Battle um, to this webinar. Um, and thank you, Jennifer, for inviting our class to be a host for this. Christina is an artist based in a Miss Kwasi Waskai Econ, also known as Edmonton, within the Aspen Parkland, the transition zone where prairie and forest meet. Her practice focuses th on thinking deeply about the concept of disaster, its complexity, and the intricacies that are intertwined within it. She looks to disaster as a series of intersecting processes, including social, environmental, cultural, political, and economic, which are implicated not only in how disaster is caused, but also in how it manifests, is responded to, and overcome. Through the research, Battle looks closely closer to both online models and plant systems for strategies to learn from and for ways we might help to frame and strengthen such response. Battle's practice prioritizes collaboration, experimentation, and failure. She has a BSc with a specialization in environmental biology from the University of Alberta, a certificate in film studies from Ryerson University, an MFA from San Francisco Art Institute, and a PhD in art and visual culture from the Western, University of Western Ontario. She also collaborates with Serena Lee as Shattered Room Moon Alliance and has exhibited internationally in festivals and galleries as both artist and curator. Thank you again, Jen, uh, Christina. Thank you. Thanks for the great um, introduction. I'm going to share my screen first so that I, because I can't talk and do at the same time. Um, reorient some things here, bear with me. All right, thanks. Thanks everybody. Thanks um, Reva for the great introduction and Jennifer um, for setting everything up and for the invitation to show work and Jamie for installing um, Mariana for the beautiful text, which I hope I noticed was linked in the chat. Um, and I hope folks will spend some time with uh, thanks, Lacey, for interpreting. And if you, if there's anything that goes on with sound or you'd like me to slow down, please maybe drop a link in the chat or a note in the chat. Um, so as Jennifer mentioned, I'm going to share right off the top a few links with you all. Um, so the first link is to the slides that I'm going to be working through. So if you want to follow along on your own, Within the slides are also all of the links of projects and, and things that I'm referring to. So you can follow along with those and have, hold on to them after our talk. Um, and then also the amazing uh, library resource that the library at the university put together um, with a number of readings that I hope you will check out. I would love for everyone to read them. Of course, the reading list is like forever ongoing because I think, um, we live in this time where there's like tons of content as you all know, tons of writing being done about these times. Um, so please check out that resource. Um, <clears throat> so it's already been mentioned that I'm speaking with you um, from Treaty 6 territory. Um, I'm a media artist and uh, my practice engages with film, video, websites, participatory practice and curatorial practice. Essentially those things that take time and I work with media as both material and subject. And all of this uh, work is situated under an interest in researching and thinking deeper about disaster. I'm especially interested in visual culture and particularly in how our engagement with media shapes our understanding and interpretation of information. And thinking critically about the tools of technology, especially that of the internet, as part of contemporary language and considering how information disseminated by online platforms operates within the framework of disaster. And at the root of my practice and my approach is a focus on collaboration, collectivity, conversation, as strategies for considering the pressing issues that um, we face today. Um, so I'm really looking forward to time uh, for questions and conversation and also recognizing that we have limited time 
And it's sometimes hard to come up with questions in the moment. Um, my practice moves pretty fluidly across research and practice. So at times I think one looks much like the other. Um, and I'm gonna spend some time just sort of diving into a couple of projects that might look like um, one or the other as well. Okay, so to start, um, I wanted to give you a bit of a sense of where I'm coming from. So Riva had mentioned my undergrad degree is in environmental biology. Um, and that was at a time when that program was new to the University of Alberta and also quite siloed. Um, I think things have changed a lot since then and uh, hopefully for the better. <laughs> Much more change to come, uh, I think we would all like, but in terms of how the institution was quite separated um, in terms of discipline at the time. Um, and I think a lot about how that, how much that experience impacted me and how much it influences my practice to this day. Um, it was really through the research tied to my PhD that I started to articulate the relationship and the role that ec ecology plays in my practice. Um, it has always had a central role, but I hadn't really had that time to really sit and think deeply about its impact. And through this reinvestigation during my PhD studies, I was able to think through the ways in which my artistic practice deviates from that which I studied within the formal institution of biology and to expand on ways of considering relationships within and across the natural world. And then also just to recognize that, um, you know, a lot has changed within the field of biology since then as well. Um, and for me, I think a lot of this difference between thinking of myself as an artist versus a biologist comes from thinking about the role that failure plays in my artistic practice, which I really value engaging with and learning from. So the texts on screen um, are two quotes from James Bridle's uh, book from I think last year called Ways of Being. Uh, Bridle is a writer that I look to a lot in my work and really lean on. And these quotes are from the introduction and both really resonated. So I'm gonna read them out loud so that we, we all have them in common. Um, all right, this is Bridle. Ecology is the study of these inner relationships, those unbreakable cords which tie everything else. Crucially, those relationships extend to things as well as beings. Ecology is fundamentally different to the other sciences in that it describes a scope and an attitude of study rather than a field. There is an ecology and ecologists of mathematics, behavior, economics, physics, history, art, linguistics, psychology, warfare, and almost any other discipline you can think of. And this overlap across disciplines and perspectives or this complexity of thought and of knowledge, it really sits at the center of my practice and research. And this uh, complexity is also inherent to the study of disaster. So I'm a media artist um, and I've really worked to clarify the way that I define media art over the years. It's constantly shifting. Um, I tend to always define it in an expanded way as one that takes time. Um, and I wanted to clarify this definition before diving into some work and especially to help situate some of the ways that I come to think about working with seeds and plants as a media artist um, by sharing some of John Durham Peter's thoughts on the ways that media both captures and fails to capture time. Um, so these are three separate quotes from uh, Peter's. Media, I will argue, are vessels and environments, containers of possibility that anchor our existence and make what we are doing possible. Above all, media capture and fail to capture time, whose fleetingness is the most beautiful and difficult of all natural facts. Media is understood as both natural and cultural. If media are vehicles that carry and communicate meaning, then media theory needs to take nature, the background, to all possible meaning seriously. And I really appreciate this expanded definition that Peters offers and the possibilities for considering media in this way. It really helps, I think, situate where my practice is coming from. So a core part of my work and research uh, looked to plant and online systems as a way to consider strategies for how we might look to and learn from the complexity of disaster um, as a way to reconsider social relations. In an overall sense, right now at least, my approach is to consider how these three areas of focus, so disaster, the internet, plants, 
um, share common elements such as community, connection, complexity, and the social. And for our purposes today, I'm going to focus on projects that research um, projects and research that center more directly around plants. So I look to plant systems and strategies to learn from in this consideration of the complexity of disaster. Ultimately, much of my work comes from spending time with and thinking about plants, whether the work is directly um, engaging with seeds or plants or not. And I've learned a lot from this ongoing seed saving project called Seeds Are Meant to Disperse. The seeds are offered as trade or gift. And through this project, I spend time thinking about issues related to food security and sustainability, species diversification, seed copyright, climate change, urban renewal, and anti-capitalist forms of exchange. I look to both plant systems and systems of technology to think more about notions of spread. And one goal of this seed saving project um, is to engage with this notion by disseminating outwards from the garden as a form of community building. And the thinking at this project really does inspire um, uh, much of what I do, uh, whether the work is about plants and seeds or not, really sits at the center. Um, and the website is there, so you can access more information about the project, or if you're someone who's looking for seeds, we're kind of coming up to that season, at least geographically, where uh, most of us are situated, uh, where it's time to kind of think about what we might plant for the summer. Um, if you'd like some seeds, there's on the website a list of all of the seeds that I have available. Uh, drop me an email. The project is going through a bit of a change uh, this year for an exhibition that I have upcoming at Fab Gallery, which is here in Edmonton. Um, so that will launch in June, which is a little offset from usually when folks who are start interested in seeds. Um, but drop me an email if you're interested. Also, all of the how-to guides and how to get started with seeds and plants are also available for download on that site. And I mentioned that my research is interested in looking to models of the internet, um, especially the ways that distributed networks function both online and off, how they shape and build community, and how that model might offer strategies for attacking larger social and political difficulties. So this is an image of a mesh network. And in a mesh network, um, it's a distributed network where each user connects and supports the next. So each of these blue dots essentially is a node um, with a group of users or a single user, and each of them are able to support one another. And thinking through this form of the distributed network really influences my seed saving project in a number of ways. Um, I see both as really inherently aligned. So that is seed dispersal and dispersion and distributed networks. And offshoots from the seed saving project are often art projects in their own right. Uh, they take the form of book projects and how-to guides or participatory projects. Um, and one of the things I think a lot about with the seed saving project is responsibility and how to shape circumstances for gifting and receiving seeds in responsible ways for sharing knowledge and information and providing opportunities for others to participate on their own time and terms. Um, and all of these, these are some examples of some of the how-to guides. They're all available on the website if you're interested. My practice is deliberately responsive and tries to engage with response as a framework. I appreciate the strategies of failure, reflection, and adaptation. And my approach is to try and kind of throw things out there along with the sense of care to see how it goes, to learn from it, and then to try again. Uh, so my PhD, which was mentioned, is in art and visual culture. Um, it's a studio-based PhD. And as a practicing artist, it was really important to me to do as a part of my research. And I've been focusing deeply on engagements of this sort of doing since my PhD was completed. Um, so my dissertation, uh, I defended it in January of 2020, uh, which as we all know, was sort of when COVID was starting to move across the globe. Um, it's a bit strange and it was a bit strange, continues to be a bit strange to have been thinking really deeply about disaster and crisis. Uh, and then to sort of put this document out into the world just at this moment when we were all collectively going through disaster and crisis in, in quite visible and affecting ways. 
Um, and so since then, I've been working to develop works that think through some of the ideas that are situated within that document. And a lot of this recent work has been driven by this idea of doing things together as a part of response. And because of the pandemic, um, I've really been interested in thinking about what it means to do things together at a distance. Recent years have allowed me to really dive into thinking about online networks in new ways from that that I had been prior to defending that dissertation. So I wanna also point to a bit of context for how I see this work situated in an artistic or historical sense. I come to consider participatory practice through extending back toward the Fluxus movement. I use prompts and instruction sets to engage with participation, as well as to consider algorithms and their impacts on the online spaces we spend a lot of time existing within. Um, on the right is a piece by Yoko Ono from 1961, which I've prompted and performed a number of times along with others as a part of my seed saving project. Uh, I'm gonna read it because it's lovely and it'd be great for everyone to know about this work. Uh, it's called Painting for the Wind and the instruction reads as follows. Cut a hole in a bag filled with seeds of any kind and place the bag where there is wind. So this is a note uh, that's taped to my computer just underneath where I'm looking right now. Um, and it's taped there as a sort of a reminder. I use repetition a lot in my work and see it as an important strategy. Um, so a number of projects are um, classified as sort of ongoing as a way to further think this through. And I also think about repetition in relation to failure in trying and then trying again, trying again. Um, and as I go through and introduce a couple of works, uh, I'm hoping that we can collectively keep some of these ideas in mind. And I hope that they will give some insight into my approach and thinking. So working with seeds and plants means paying close attention to a number of things, responsibility and the potential that each seed holds, time to seasons and what timing is right for seeds and plants, the time it takes to thrive and produce seed, Adaptation, how seeds and plants thrive and don't thrive under certain conditions, and how the ability to both pay attention and adapt to such needs. Sustainability, how seed quantities shift given multiple circumstances, whether it be weather, climate, insect, soil, time, space. And how working with others or working with community also means paying close attention to these same things. All right, so um, this project began in 2019. It's called Reclaiming the Invisible. Um, I had been invited by artist Leanne Olson to develop programming for her exhibition that was at the Mitchell Art Gallery that's here in Edmonton. Um, and the project was focused on thinking about waste. Um, and in sharing seeds over the years, I'd been thinking a lot more about this notion of responsibility. Again, like tied to what it means to send seeds to others and share them with others. Um, as well as how to center seeds, um, the seeds needs when working with them in an artistic context like this. And I've really learned so much about thinking and responsibility from Robin Wall Kimmermer's writing. Um, I really appreciate how she speaks about gifts and gift giving, and there's links to those texts um, in the library resource as well. So this project, I was thinking a lot about how to set up circumstances for others to engage while putting an emphasis on the role of responsibility for those taking part. On an evening in the winter of 2019, we listened to a presentation by a land reclamation scientist I had invited into the space of the gallery who was working and researching in Northern Alberta. Participants were each given five sunflower seeds to plant along with a zine of information and prompts to think about in preparation for their planting. Uh, sunflowers are known hyperaccumulators, which means they're capable of taking up toxins from the soil. And we prepared the seeds to later plant in the spring, made reminders for ourselves to remember to plant them. Um, and then participants were invited to send me maps of where they planted their seeds across the city with the idea that I would later visit and gather seeds from those flowers. So that was in the winter of 2019. And then with the goal of planting in the spring of 2020 over the summer, um, and the project kind of fell to the wayside a little bit because of the timing of spring and summer coincided with the starting of uh, truly the pandemic here in Edmonton. 
Um, so I revisited the project in 2023, which is what's visible on screen. I, and I thought I'd share uh, this work. So this is a video installation that has the title of the seed saving project, Seeds Are Meant to Disperse, it's from 2022. Um, it's an example of how the seed project has been exhibited in a gallery in a more descriptive way. Um, so the work is a two screen video installation with printed collaged images of seeds on the wall. Um, and it was made as a way to sort of help myself even reflect on where the seed saving project sits for me. Uh, the video at the center of the work describes some of the thinking of some of my thinking about the project, at least at that time. Um, and the video is also visible. If you visit that link, you can watch it, the two screens. And along with that work that was in the gallery, um, there was also this participatory project. We offered 20 tomato starter plants grown from seeds that I saved the previous season, which when I saved them, I wasn't entirely sure what variety of tomato the seeds might be, which is very common over here for me. Um, Participants were invited to grow their tomato seeds to harvest, offered tips of how to save the seeds for future seasons uh, through a series of postcards, and then asked to send me back at least one, uh, one seed along with information on what variety of tomato it ended up growing into. So this is an example of one of the postcards and seeds that came back to me. Um, in this case, it ended up being not one of the varieties that I thought it was, it ended up being sweet millions. Um, so this project was a bit of an experiment for me within the gallery. Um, and since then I've quite shifted a lot how I work with participatory projects like this uh, within with institutions. It takes a lot of conversation, time, labor, resources, and care uh, to foster working with publics in ways that support growing living things. So I tend to now try to work with seeds and plants in ways that remain more entirely sort of in my control and where I have the ability to have direct conversation with participants. Um, and even then it doesn't always work. I'm still learning and adapting and thinking about participation as a mode that requires certain parameters and frameworks. So the uncertainty around which variety those seed tomato seeds were in the project um, really holds a central role of my thinking as I save seeds across the years, especially within this work with the tomato plants. Um, and I grow and save seeds in a small urban garden. I don't follow the rules really when it comes to seed saving, of which there are particular rules uh, if you're doing it in the sort of air quote right way. Um, my practice of growing really prioritizes use and utility. So, you know, what I, the space that I have available, what foods I maybe want to um, grow and, and later eat, what seeds I'd like to save. Um, it really prioritizes that, prioritizes that use over variety maintenance. Um, and so some of these ideas are also considered in this publication. This is a screenshot of the, the booklet. It was published by Artspeak in 2021, and it thinks through seeds and copyright and um, how that overlaps with data and technology. So if you're interested, you can check that booklet out. All right, so this is a work from 2020 called Connecting Through Grasses. It's a project that I revisited again this year um, as this, there's a satellite at the center of the project um, and it's beginning its decommission, which means it started to crash back into the earth. Um, so it should, it's slated to crash back into earth, which I know is like, just such a weird thing to sort of say uh, off the cuff, but uh, sometime this year or next year, um, it's always expected that the satellites, this is what end, ends up with them. They always crash back to earth at some point, but this particular one, Terra had been circling the earth for quite a bit longer than anticipated. Um, but soon the participatory that is attached to this work won't be able to be performed again. Um, so I've been revisiting it this year with sort of this anticipation that this is the end of this project. So I'll read from the description of it. Looking to prairie grass ecosystems, as well as the technologies that map and reflect the diminishing biome, connecting through grasses considers how we might both map and define prairie boundaries anew. Considering how satellites passing overhead reflect an image of the earth and thus ourselves back to us, 
and how these images shape or misshape our understanding of the land and our relationship to it. The work looks closer at Terra, a research satellite that has circled the Earth since 1999, constructing images for use in the monitoring of environmental and climate data. Uh, so the work also includes this participatory project uh, that ties in with Seeds Are Meant to Disperse. It consists of grass seed packs, which I send out to participants by mail through a website. And the project is solely for those living in the prairie region, so defined colonially by the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And participants are asked to map the locations of where they plant their seeds on a collective map on Google Places. That's the screenshot on the right. Um, and also this link on the bottom. Um, it's been really incredible to watch um, and to think about what it means to do this work together across distance. Um, and then also this idea of, you know, maybe having the potential one day to watch those grasses grow through the lens of updated satellite imagery across time and into the future. Um, and if you're interested, I encourage you to visit the map because uh, people really spend a lot of time thinking about where they're gonna plant their seeds. There's often descriptors or little stories about um, where, plant, where, where and why locations were selected. So for the project each week, um, which usually happens across a month, I sent out images, sorry, I sent out emails uh, with things to think about as people plant their grass seed. Uh, the emails touch on issues related to borders, colonization, environmental loss, and across the region, and our relationship to images of the areas captured by satellite technology. And each week I also sent timetables for when the Terra satellite would be overhead, along with prompts to help think about what it means to be under the satellite's view. And all of this, uh, these emails and this information is archived on the website if you're interested. Um, I'm currently reworking this project, so without the Terra satellite, I'm still really interested in the way that the project unfolded, um, in the ways that it kind of brings people together to plant grass seed across the prairies, but also the stories and the information that's shared um, as people plant those seeds. Um, so in the exhibition that I have coming up in the summer, this project will be reworked. All right, so I mentioned uh, working with series and ongoing projects as a strategy and how I really appreciate making use of repetition in my practice. Um, I work with ongoing projects as a way to approach these recurring questions from multiple angles and to help spend time really thinking things through, you know, like trying to think things through deeply across time. So this ongoing project uh, is called Forecast. It considers the entanglement between environmental, social, political, and economic challenges facing the current moment. It acts as a sort of umbrella for a number of works in, that includes both artistic and writing projects. And elements from this project are what are on view at Gallery 1CO3. So one of the first projects tied to forecast is called Learning the Signals, Changes Coming. I had been invited to develop a public art project for the Bonavista Biennale in Newfoundland in 2021 in the fall. Um, and ultimately the work ended up including a participatory project, a website, handmade seed packs, and a digitally printed flag. So the project for me began during that summer uh, when I invited those living across the island and area to participate in an online survey to help me learn about the, re the region as I was researching and learning about strategies to predict the weather. And I saw the survey as serving as a sort of site visit since I wasn't able to travel to the East Coast um, uh, to perform the work as it was being developed. And I was thinking a lot about how this data might be useful in my approach to thinking about weather prediction as a way to imagine the future. So these are some of the responses to the question, if you had to describe the day as a taste, what would it be? And some of the responses, the air tastes like a not too tart lemon, water straight from a woodland stream, the air tastes like buttercup. And I used the experience of this interaction and these responses to questions, along with this focused time studying and trying to learn from the weather of the region as a way to develop the work that was later installed on site. 
Uh, one of the common references across the information shared through the participatory project was the smell of flowers. Um, so in this iteration of the project, on-site visitors were offered a custom-made seed pack with information on how to predict the weather, um, seeds to plant both on-site and as they cross the island, and an instruction set with prompts. That's the image on the right here. Um, along with this flag that was demarcating the location that read, the air will smell like flowers. And flowers at the center of this project are known to be quite hardy and able to withstand disruption, uh, which is critical for the future of the region, expected to be one of the most hard hit because of climate change. Yarrow and harebell are both natural to the region and both are flowers that thrive after disturbance. Given the state of natural disasters felt across the region, even since the project was launched, you know, it's been in the news quite a fair bit. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how these plants might continue on into the future. So this is an image from the Air We Breathe, which is the work that sort of occupies the biggest footprint in the gallery um, at 1CO3. And ultimately, I also see it as being under the umbrella of the overall forecast project. Uh, the Air We Breathe is, is an expanded experimental documentary that thinks through the complexities of air pollution by weaving together themes of environmental catastrophe, environmental racism, cultural and political shifts, and conspiracy. I think a lot about how to imagine as well as how to image or visualize these complexities, how we see them, how to see them anew, how to grapple with the overlapping complexity. And in a sense, my work considers how to get better at connecting the dots um, across these complexities of disaster and how to make these connections better visible to others. So these are two video stills um, from the work that sits at the center of the Air We Breathe. Uh, the first image reads, you wouldn't know it from these images, but if you were here, you might have smelled it. And this question of how to visualize not just air pollution, but all of the connected complex and unjust elements that relate to it comes up a lot across this work. Um, so here I'm thinking about environmental racism and where polluting industries are located, the invisibility in general of the impacts and repercussions of polluting industries, the lack of investment in making significant changes, and the myths and disinformation along with the denialism tied to anti-environmentalism, anti-social justice, and the ways in which this disinformation is fueling conspiracies that are often aligned with and even funded by such industries. And the work for me really ends with a series of questions. It's all ongoing. I'm really interested in thinking about how we might map our way out of all of this and towards some other potential future than the path that we're currently on. And uh, research for this project, so for the air we breathe, began in the summer of 2022. Uh, I really value research that's situated in relationship building and conversation with others. So um, for one month in the summer, uh, six artists in Edmonton were invited to engage with this research along with me um, across the, the month of, I think it was August into September. Um, and I'm interested in working with prompts as a strategy for both defining and working through research questions, as well as working in collaboration as motivation to look at and consider difficult things. The project was interested in considering storytelling and memory as a way to make sense of complexity and to connect dots across things that otherwise might appear unrelated, as well as to share in the in experience together. Um, so for one month, we practiced smelling the air and describing those smells as a way to help us better visualize them. Um, and for Gallery uh, 1CO3, a group that's working with Rowan Crow will participate in this participatory project um, across month, March and into April. So the image on screen is one of the postcards from our project over that summer. The front of it reads two stories about smell and time. And then there's also a Google map indicator of the Nestle Purina dog food factory in Denver, which uh, for most of my time living in Denver was just like uh, about five minutes away. Um, and on the back of this po postcard, is um, text that shares two memories tied to smell that are traveling through the air. Um, and then both of those memories are also um, 
voiced in the video that sits at the center of the work. And then there's also this prompt on the back of the postcard. To do this week, consider a memory, consider a memory where you have noticed a connection between time and smell. Share it on the on your blank postcard and then mail it on to another in the group. So as a group, we sent postcards back and forth as we contemplated all of these things together. Uh, this is one that I sent uh, in response to the prompt. Consider those smells that aren't easily identified, along with those that, that can hardly be smelled. How might we better witness the invisible? What strategies exist to translate measurements into the sensorial? Share your thoughts on a blank postcard and mail it on to another. Um, so what really sits at the heart of a lot of these participatory practices um, or participatory projects, sorry, is this sense of like thinking through things together, responding to them in whatever way makes sense for participants, whether that's writing or drawing, um, whatever it is, collage, and then sharing those responses to one another. Um, some of these prompts are also available in the gallery at 1CO3 um, for you to take home as postcards yourself, and then you can send them on to whomever you like. So while the group um, with Rowan Crow's class is gonna spend more time uh, monitoring the air quality across March, uh, visitors to the gallery are also invited to participate and to practice describing the air, the quality of air and help monitor the PM 2.5 values in Winnipeg across the exhibitions run. Um, so there are postcards available for you to pick up in the gallery and you're prompted to consider how would you describe the air quality of the air outside today? For example, how gritty it is, how humid it is, how hazy, how much pollen or other particulates sort of feel or you're sensing are present. Um, and then you're also asked to describe, if you had to describe the air as a taste, what would it be? Um, to translate those responses in language or drawing or, you know, whatever is appropriate for you. And then also to record the PM 2.5 value of the day. And PM 2.5 is the fine particulate matter that's in the air. Um, so it's usually like a mix of um, smoke, emissions, um, aerosols. Um, and it's one of the sort of great indicators of the... Um, the amount of toxins or, or problematics of air quality on a particular day. Um, we here in Edmonton are having like really a not great air quality day today, uh, which is, you know, how it often is, <laughs> but it's also maybe appropriate for this conversation. All right, so um, I feel like I've been talking for a long time and I wanted to end on uh, something that I've been thinking a lot about lately, as I'm sure many of you have also, and that's climate grief and anxiety, um, especially as, you know, I'm talking about these things that are quite heavy and very real for so many, you know, we're all experiencing this and being affected by it. Um, and, you know, we're also experiencing this crisis that's very much expanded over the years, maybe more so visibly in recent years. Um, and also it's a crisis that we're not really making a lot of headway in circumventing. So I thought I'd end with this quote by Natasha Myers from her How to Grow Livable Worlds, uh, 10 Not So Easy Steps texts. It should be in the library resource if you'd like to read it, read the entire text. I'll make sure um, I find a link if not. Um, and here is the quote from Natasha Myers. Yes, there are apocalypses already ongoing all around us. The decimation of the boreal forest to extract bitumen on stolen indigenous land in Canada is one such apocalypse. But giving in to apocalyptic thinking is itself a kind of exit strategy, an easy out. Ruin porn thrives on this narrative of a world without us. And I really hope that my work and the work that's in the gallery is read and seen within this context of being really invested in trying to imagine other pathways or tangents or ideas um, out of this um, path that we're currently find ourselves on. Thank you. Um, I would love, you know, obviously conversation really sits at the center of this work. I would love uh, to hear what folks are thinking or questions that you might have come up with. 
Uh, again, recognizing, I know it's not easy to always like come up with a question in the moment. Um, so um, in the links that I've shared, my email is also kind of all over the place on the website. Please feel free to email me if you have a thought or a question uh, later on. Thank you, Christina. Um, obviously your work has so many layers of um, complexity and touches on um, a number of social, political, economic, um, but also just individual um, responsibilities <laughs> and um, um, areas of kind of influence. And one thing that we um, have talked about in this class, and just to jump right into the questions, if you don't mind, <laughs> Yeah, one of the things that we've talked about in this class and some of our students, like some of us are art history majors, some of us are um, environmental science students, um, is this idea of um, futility and failure that you brought up kind of towards the beginning as um, something that's present in your work um, and how much um, um, you mentioned that you are starting to attempt to sort of control more um, some of the participatory parts of your work, perhaps. Um, because we were talking about the SEED project, for instance, um, and the idea that it really relies heavily on the individuals who pick up the SEED packets to be responsible and do the right thing or throw them away on the street, like that's a possibility, right? So how does that factor in or to this idea of failure in your work um, and maybe futility in the larger scheme of disaster, right? Yeah, I love this question. Um, so maybe also to help clarify, so the way that I come to think about failure really comes from thinking uh, through artistic practice, right? Where there is a lot of discourse and writing and strategizing around failure as like this, this potential to find your answers or solutions. Um, and so I think within that, this sense of recognizing failure as something that has potential to uh, solve problems is the way that I tend to approach it. Um, and you're really right, like the Seeds Are Meant to Disperse project has changed a lot over the years and I'm kind of constantly adapting it and changing it, even in terms of language, like the project began, um, it was titled uh, Seeds for the End of the World at first. Maybe to back up a quick second before I go on that tangent. So, you know, seed saving was something I was already doing. It wasn't like a capital A art project. I still quite struggle with it being so, even though I clearly make it as artwork. Um, but when the project began, uh, you know, I was sharing with seeds with friends and family, and then it sort of like morphed into this art project called Seeds, or Seeds for the End of the World. And then I had a moment where I was just like so uncomfortable with that language. Um, I think it also coincided with a time when you were seeing a lot of like any, like whatever, for the end of the world, um, especially in the academic writing and things. Um, and I really wasn't like comfortable with the way that that language was sort of being taken up collectively within the arts. So I changed the title. Um, it also started with language that was more situated around bartering for seeds. And I realized, ah, this isn't exactly what I'm interested in. Um, so really like shifting the way the project um, occurs and learning from it is I think, Ne necessarily like begins with the failure of it and then trying to adapt in a new way. Um, the thing that you mentioned uh, really does sit as like one of my worst case nightmares of the seeds just being shared and then like thrown into a cupboard or something and not used or not shared on with others. So I really try to develop these frameworks for thinking about that responsibility. I think that having to think through responsibility for seeds um, it's also maybe like an easy way for folks to kind of grapple with thinking through responsibility in other ways. Um, and I try to weave into the project. I certainly don't have all the answers, um, but I think 
like even just having that conversation of like what it means if you don't plant that seed or you don't share it with someone who will, because truly, you know, it's hard sometimes to do this work, right? We often, I think, are excited about doing things and then we don't have the time or capacity to plant those seeds. So the quote is repetition as spell as ritual. Um, yeah, I think there is something about it for me that um, repetition, you know, as a part of artistic practice, but I think also extending into like life in general, um, it really allows me to like spend time thinking about one thing for a really long time. So like that sense of doing something over and over and repeating it um, and being able to like learn from what works and what doesn't, but then also to just like repeat doing that thing that works or that doesn't. Um, and I do see it as being a part of ritual, right? Like it's something that you're doing yourself again and again and repeating it and learning about it and, and learning from it. Um, and maybe, yeah, that is tied to thinking about this futility in a way, because it's something, right? It's like, I keep sort of throwing out language that's like, you know, doing things with others and how important that is to me. And I, I really do think that that doing is something. Um, you know, I think it's important for all of us to also recognize, you know, the change that we need is not really going to come at the individual level, right? Like we need bigger shifts um collectively at a societal level but maybe like spending time with others doing these things in a micro way in a smaller way is the thing that then leads to these bigger shifts um and then maybe there's something within the question uh that has is questioning about the sense of ritual as well um which i'd love to hear um from barb if, if that's true or how you're thinking about it um well, we, I have another question actually that's maybe um, slightly related. Or what are uh, we had a, cl a class question mm -hmm. about your use of text mm -hmm. um, and the way that your your the your use of text is so poetic, um, but you're also using it to collect information um, in you know an almost science based way, but it's also an art or poetic based way. I mean, we're just curious about your use of uh text in this way as an aesthetic even yeah i love text i love storytelling i love um quotes and so i often gather quotes from others and then um, share them and think about them over and over um i think you know when i think about okay like, i would have really truly been like a horrible scientist i recognize that very much now um but i think of one of the things where i started to kind of recognize the relationship between biology and art and artistic practice, um, especially as a media artist, was really thinking about communication and information. I think that, you know, also when I started thinking about this as an artist was, you know, now decades on. And I think for so long, it was quite clear that one of the things that the science, the discipline of science was really struggling with is communicating information and ideas to the public. Um, and, you know, struggling not because of their own fault, but really because there was this concerted effort to work against them in that communication or that sharing of information. So I really see artistic practice as a helpful strategy for communicating all of that information that comes from a world or a discipline that maybe doesn't um, always speak the same language as those in the public, right? Um, and so I really see my use of text as a way to disseminate information and maybe translating ideas that, you know, are often written in a particular language within the realm of science into a language that maybe um, is easier to digest for some, or at least for myself. Um, I love hearing that that is read as being poetic because uh, that means a lot to me. Um, but I think it really has to do with that translation and that, and again, that distributed way of thinking, right, of like spreading out as much information as possible so that others can pick it up and translate it in their own way or speak to it in their own way. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's interesting, too, how the 
And we have a online question from Sean Jordan, who's asking about um, your Fluxus influence, which the piece you showed us from um, the uh, from Yoko Ono was is uh, very much a text based piece too. And so mm -hmm. uh, for me, Fluxus. When I think of Fluxus historically, I think of their relationship to everyday life. Um, but what are you, and, and I could see that being present in your work too, but um, what was your kind of, um, or how do you connect your work to Fluxus? Yeah. Yeah, I love this question. I sort of like deliberately like throw that slide in, <laughs> hoping that we can talk more about it. Uh, so I think part of the answer is also that, you know, I'm a media artist, so I come from experimental film and video, um, which does have a really direct relationship with the Flexus movement. You're speaking about the everyday and even that sort of um, history and legacy of documenting the everyday, right? With like the early video porta packs or 16 millimeter film, super eight film. So that really is also a part of like my training as an artist and how I came to think about our practice stems from that legacy. Um, and I think when I think about, um, you know, this relationship between experimental film and video and participatory practice, it all really comes together in Fluxus movement as well. Um, and, you know, I think we could also extend some of that to even the thinking of um, like watching experimental film and the tradition of coming together in a dark room and sitting together and watching and talking things through, reading about things after through program notes. Um, so that's sort of where I come to think about it. And then there's something with the instruction set as well that I that um, really speaks to me as an artist. And I think, you know, that instruction set, which I see as coming through a lot of those poetics and works from the Fluxus movement, um as a strategy for participatory practice is what i'm really interested in yeah that makes perfect sense actually in your work thanks christina mm -hmm. um can we switch gears slightly or though although we're still kind of thinking about aesthetics jennifer here um from 1co3 had a question too um she's wondering about the bright colors um in your work which is not just at the in the gallery show right but it looks like it's a kind of across your practice you use these bright uh, fluorescent colors in a lot of ways. Um, it's on your website, um, which to me is your website is also kind of an extension of your practice as a whole. But what is this, what are these bright colors um, uh, signaling for you? Is it like something ominous? Um, what's going on there? Oh, I love thinking about that it, color is ominous. Um, yeah, I love, uh, I love color neon colors bright colors um so i i feel like in a way my answer is like yeah i don't know it's just what comes out it's just like how i make things i think but i also think that um where a lot of that comes from is like internet culture and really thinking about also when i say internet culture you know maybe we have to also date myself a bit because I think, you know, I was truly like influenced by the early days of the internet and um, that sort of glitch aesthetic, um, which often, you know, has a lot of highlighted text, has a lot of bright colors to differentiate between maybe what's more informative and what's more um, affective. So um, most likely a lot of it comes to that and points toward that. Um, but I also think a lot about joy and beauty, beauty. I really, you know, I'm a media artist, film video artist. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how to construct an image using a lens that's pointed out at the world. Um, and for me, like thinking about images that have a sense of beauty is really important and joy. And for me, color is really associated with that. Um, maybe there's also something about, you know, like the reality that a lot of these works are like, truly thinking through really heavy things and, and kind of dark things if you sort of take them in one direction. So wanting to um, work in ways that butt up against that as well. Um, but then um, I think there's also, I think when Jennifer or maybe it was Yuriva had read something about my bio, you mentioned Shattered Moon Alliance, which is a collaborative project that I do with Serena Lee. Um, there's a really strong inherent interest in science fiction in my work as well, whether it is like literally translated in the work or not. Um, so I think some of that color, some of those answers come from thinking of sci-fi as well. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, 
we probably have maybe one minute left, <laughs> but um, it kind of related to the bright colors in, well, not related, maybe a polar opposite is the idea of smell that comes out so much in the exhibition and that is referred to so much in the exhibition. And you're asking us, you're prompting us to think about what the weather smells like, for instance, today. And um, our class talked about that too, and was wondering um, what, um, what kind of, what brought you to this idea of smell? Um, a lot of the students in this class spoke about having, you know, sense, sense sensitivity, mm -hmm. um, and you in your show asks us to think how to represent the invisible. And um, in some ways it felt like to be asked to smell something consciously <laughs> is asking us to have an embodied experience of what you what's invisible maybe. Um, but yeah, what's the what's the sort of connection to smell for you? Yeah, so I think um, it somewhat comes from thinking about memory and thinking about storytelling. Uh, the Nestle dog food Purina factory that I showed the, the postcard of, um, like, maybe is where I really started thinking about this in a more conscious way, but um, it really was a smell that, like, rep repeatedly every day at a certain time when you're outside of my backyard, you can smell the dog food factory. And it was a really tricky smell. It's very hard for me to put it into language. Um, and that sort of really got me thinking about like how it, this difficulty I have, and I think maybe others do too, maybe I'm wrong, um, but really of like describing smell using language. Um, I realized that it, you know, while I think smell is something that's so sensorial and we all have a sense of it, right? Like we know like, oh, I can smell something. Being able to actually put words into that or describe what it is or connect what it means or where it's coming from I found to be really difficult. And it was something that I really just wanted to practice more, like really practicing, like how it is that memory is attached to smell, how it is that I describe what those smells and also taste. I feel like taste, I struggle with even more of like first smelling a thing and then, and then translating that into a taste and then translating that taste into language or describing it. Um, so really it's about wanting to practice that more. And I think when it comes to thinking about air quality, um, part of the reason why smell like was the way to think through air quality for me is because it's so invisible, right? Like I, um, you know, I live in a place and I, um, that has really poor air quality most of the time, but you often can't see it. You almost never can see it but you can feel it. And I was always feeling it and kind of like questioning, you know, why is it that my throat feels this way? Why am I coughing so much all of a sudden? And then being able to try to like map out where that is being sensed from and where it comes from. Like my body is reading it, but I'm not cognitively aware of what's going on. So really trying to practice being more aware of what it is. So, um, you know, when I am smelling something in the air or coughing or you know, my throat is tight or some, my lungs feel tight. Um, trying to like describe what it is that I'm smelling so I can remember later, like, oh, this maybe is this. And then also paying a lot of attention now, especially over the last couple of years to those air quality readings as well and trying to make associations between being able to like see it because I think it is so um, invisible. Well, thank you again for this, Christina. Thanks for visiting our class. Thanks for sharing um, your practice with us um, in such a generous and thoughtful way um, and for answering our questions. Um, I am just want to um, encourage anyone who's watching from outside the class to take a look at um, Christina's It's All About Lettuce project <laughs> on her website because our class is going to be actually doing a version of it this oh, week cool. for our nature action assignment that we do every week. Um, so uh, and anyone's welcome to join us <laughs> in planting their own indoor lettuce too. So take a look at the project and you'll 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 understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I love knowing that too. I'd love to know more about how your lettuce growing goes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks for the great questions and conversation. And thanks everyone for listening. I really appreciate it.